Okay, and then we'll uh, then we'll stop it before the movie starts, and we'll start it again. So, so thanks all for joining us. My name is Tim Brown. Most of you know me. Uh, thanks for joining us as we kick off our movie night series with "Changing the World," a documentary about the life of organizer and strategist Heather Booth. I first met Heather in 2016 when I was working with the Democracy Spring team to plan a, a march from Philadelphia down to Washington, followed by a week of actions at our nation's capital. And she advised us on the strategies and tactics in which thousands of people put their bodies on the line to protest the Citizens United, United ruling that allows private money to corrupt our public sphere. As you'll soon discover, Heather has been at the center of nearly all major issues for the past 50 years, work that she continues to thrive in today. Must organize on issues. Oh, it, it's now recording. So, um, but after Reagan was elected, I realized we really had to make that shift. And then I became very active in elections. And I became, um, I went to work at the Democratic Party uh, nationally, which was a shock to me, uh, maybe a shock to them. And I became the training director. We trained thousands of people who are now uh, part of a part of a trained political cadres around the country. Um, and even in the last election, while I supported Elizabeth Warren in the primary, I ended up being the director of progressive and seniors outreach for the Biden-Harris campaign uh, and did that for eight months and then worked on Georgia and then moved back onto issues, um, first on issues around the Supreme Court uh, with a group called Demand Justice. And now I'm working with a group uh, to focus on passing what was called Build Back Better, a great investment on climate and childcare and negotiation on uh, prescription drug prices. Bo, I see your sign, Medicare for all. Uh, <laughs> one part is getting the, <laughs> putting the, the pharmaceutical companies on notice so that I really view the centerpiece is building a people's power as you're building it and using that power long-term, not just for a summer or a semester or a year, but ongoing. And then using that power on the issues and on the elections and for the support and for the accountability in a virtuous circle. Yeah, I, I agree. So, uh, and, and, you know, we had talked about this previously, so like the, you, you have to, you can be outside uh, banging on the castle wall, or you could be inside when you have with some power. And that really makes a difference um, when, when you can do that. That's, that's the ultimate goal of organizing to put your people there in power. Um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it, it mentioned a little bit in the movie, but I wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit more on well, what made you decide to do this work? I mean, were you planning on doing something else and you ended up, whoops, I'm an organizer or how did this happen? By the way, I think we're, uh, Tim and I are gonna talk for a little while and then we'll open it up. The whole thing will go for no more than an hour. So we'll end by, by nine o'clock and um, maybe we'll open it up in another 15 minutes or so. So if you've got questions, comments, alternate views, this would be great to, uh, to raise them and uh, offer your thoughts. Um, so why did I get involved? You know, I'll answer, and then I wanted to ask you, Tim, why you got involved. And I actually think each person, Lisa, Stan, Merle, all of you, Rivka, <laughs> to think about, well, why did you get involved? Why did you stay involved? Why did you maybe drop out and come back in? Because the answer to those questions are among the reasons that people organize and that we need to work on to recruit more, to build our numbers every day. Um, I'd say there's at least three levels. One level is I was brought up in a very loving family that really had uh, as their values that we should have love in our hearts for each other. I, I believe we should have love at the center um, and that we should leave the society better than when we found it, 
even, you know, I was a Girl Scout when I was a, a young girl. And um, you were supposed to, whatever the campsite was, you had to not just make it nice, you had to make it better right. than it was when you got there. And I was brought up with those beliefs. But the second is when I was involved, particularly in Mississippi in the Freedom Summer Project that you may have seen in the movie and many of you were of a generation where we lived through those years. I saw that even when things seem hopeless, that when you organize, you can change the world. And even a short-term defeat can be turned into a long-term victory if you don't give up and if you work with others, not just on your own, but together we can change the world. And I'd say the third level, the one was personal and a, uh, values driven. Right. One was seeing the results and I wanted to make this a better world and I saw that it could work. And the third was one of the things people said in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, I was in the Northern branch, Friends of SNCC, was that we wanted to build a beloved community. And there's a kind of support. I think I see Tommy nodding his head, yes, that there's a a kind of support we build, even with a Zoom call like this, though I, I do miss the times when we'd all be together. But you build a sense of community and caring. Uh, we saw someone on the, um, was it Sandy on the uh, chat before, who said that it, I'm gonna miss the exact message, but it was at 86 in a few days, she had a, an operation we hope she's doing better. We care about her. We want to support her. Sandy, you're looking great and great to see you. So I'd say those were the reasons that I got involved. And it's really because of the joy of being with people and seeing how we change lives that I stay involved. But Tim, why did you get involved? I hate bullies. Um... I really do. I, I grew up in, a, in, a, in a, an environment where my, my, my family, my dad was a bully. And I just, I just, I saw this, it's injustice. And I've always been angry about it. Uh, and every time I see injustice, I would stand up to it. I got beaten up a number of times because of that. But um, I just felt like what's right is right. And you have to do the right thing, no matter what it is, uh, no matter what you face and you face your own fears in order to do that. And, and I just, you know, I, I just can't stand seeing the kind of injustice that goes on and, and you have to stand up. So I learned that from my mother, who was this little bit of a thing from from Wales with a little bit of a brogue on her. And and she just like she would take off her glasses and raise one eyebrow and tell people what she thought and they got in line. So I, maybe that's probably where I got that from. But yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people that we, we think of, like the people that we love, uh, the the one the ones that we care about and 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 how their lives are being negatively affected by things and this is what causes us to do the things that we do. That's why I got involved. I just I love this work. I can't imagine doing anything else. So I, um so you you, might, you want you mentioned to me uh, in a, a, in a conversation recently about that as activists and organizers we need to be agents of hope. Uh, can you talk about what you meant with that? Well, you know, I, I just saw in the chat, Stan had a note that said, sometimes people say we organize on the basis of self-interest. And I believe that we have to find the interests that other people have and connect to those interests. But we also need to feed people's spirits and souls and hearts. And uh, it may be a uh, faith-based or non-faith-based or no faith at all, but it may be about, um, we do want to inspire people to take action. And to do that, you have to believe that change is possible, even in hard times, and that it's particularly possible if we take steps to make that change. And I think that that's in part how we treat each other, having love at the center, 
and also having a strategic plan for organizing. So you're not just doing one thing and another and this action and that, oh, let's do a Twitter storm. Let's go down to the state capitol. Let's have a march. But what's the plan? What's the theory for how we're going to win? And how are we gonna to win together? And then even if we don't have an immediate victory, we see where we were in our strategy and we can alter the strategy. Yeah, and that, that leads me to a question I've been thinking about a lot. So, so can, can you talk about a campaign where things didn't go as planned and maybe what you would have done different? What did you end up doing differently about it? Well, I've certainly been in campaigns where I've lost and even ones where I've won. Every victory is only a step to a greater victory. But when you go, just three, three different examples of campaigns that either you'd say the campaign didn't go right, or even if it went right, we, we didn't have the power to win. Um, you know, in the movie, the first, the first flyer I ever remember handing out was against the death penalty. I think it was about, I don't know, 1958 or something. I was really, I was barely a teenager. And the death penalty. <laughs> who, who, who thought we could actually impact the death penalty? But right now, uh, in the majority populations of this country, there is no, there is either a pause, a hold, or no death penalty. I don't know if it's a majority of the states, it's almost, but in the largest states, in California, in New York, and there's been a hold on it. And it's because people chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. So we didn't win right away. But what also happened from that is people were recruited. I was recruited. Organization was built. Or another example, I worked on, I managed the campaign for marriage equality uh, for, um, that won marriage equality. And sometimes, by the way, I get asked to run campaigns where I'm not exactly in the community prior but sometimes the people who are in the community, everyone knows each other's business. Whereas I have, I have only the interest of advancing the campaign. I'm not looking, I'm not looking to be the candidate. I'm not looking to get elected. And so it makes me in some ways for this role more effective. But so uh, when marriage equality, the first fight started, there were at least 10 referenda around the country and they lost. They lost, 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 they lost 10 times. They went back and figured out when you talk about marriage, it was frightening to some people when you talked about love and and being with the person you love, it started to change the conversation. When you have a conversation with people, one of the things I love about your group is you're supporting people who go out door to door. Well, they do something that's called deep canvassing. It's not just at the door, knock, knock, vote for Joe or Sue or vote for me. That may be important, but it's just a transactional. But you go to the door and you say to someone, this is who I am, this is the group I'm with. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about something, Do you know, um, that you tell your story about uh, a person who, uh, or tell the story about a person who uh, wanted to be married and wanted to have the rights of full partnership and couldn't have it. And then you pause and you say, have you ever had a situation where you felt all alone and people were treating you unfairly and mean and you had no place to go and you didn't know what to do? Have you ever faced that? And you stop. And maybe one out of 10 people say, you know, I did have a situation like that. And people who, in fact, you, you start these deep canvas conversations, you say, uh, marriage equality is on the ballot. Would you, um, do you have the right to marry the person you love? Where would you put yourself on from a zero to 10? Zero being I'd never support it, 10 being I would support it. 
and let's say the person says zero, never supported. You have this conversation, maybe one in 10, one in five respond and say, I have had an experience like that. And then you talk back and forth on it as real people. And at the end you say, what do you now think you would do about this referendum? And the answer becomes, I'm an eight. I probably would support it. And I want to introduce you to my <coughs> uncle who is gay. But that's what organizing is about. And it's forming those relationships. So those are campaigns where we initially were losing. And it's particularly relevant now because they're things that, you know, we've won certain things and we haven't won others. We didn't win on voting rights in the Senate. We still might win something. We didn't win this Build Back Better. I've been working on it for eight months. We haven't won it yet. Will we win something? It remains to be seen, still possibly. But we'll also build organization, increase our support, and increase people's commitment to being for these issues. So, so <clears throat> I was reflecting upon your your your, your summer of freedom, uh, and, and Gloria Gilman has a question about this, which I think is relevant. So, you saw the kind of blatant white nationalism that was common in the South back then, right? But today, we're seeing this revival of white nationalism, uh, and we're also seeing things like they're trying to restrict voting rights of of black and brown people or any or students. Uh, does your past work inform you about how to deal with this? Well, the first part is you have to make sure that the people who are most impacted themselves are organized because it's their struggle and you can't want it more than they want it. And the truth is you don't. So the people, someone needs to be an organizer and organizers from that community. Now in 1964, the black community in Mississippi asked many white Northern students to come down and help. A few years later, by 1967, they asked the white students, we don't want you part of this. And SNCC actually divided and whites were moved out of SNCC and we were encouraged to organize in white communities that also needed work. But the first part is you or make sure that the people who want the change themselves have a voice and organizers themselves. I'm not saying that we decide for others, but others decide. And then if there's a role that we can have, that's great. Then there are other people. So that's one set of people. There's another set of people who are the haters who are the Proud Boys, who are the Trump supporter, who are the, the, uh, the Trump loyalists, who were the insurrection. And we're not gonna get them. And I don't spend my time on them. And I don't even care if they're angrier at me for whatever I'm doing. But then there's another group. And they're people who are not sure about where to go. Just an example on this trucker cavalcade. The trucker cavalcade in Canada, just uh, some facts about it. The, um, it was organized by elements of the extreme right wing, the Proud Boys equivalent, uh, both internationally and in Canada, the kind of uh, Manafort, Paul Manafort style people, MAGA people. Um, and the people who initially organized it, Canadian truckers, are 90% vaccinated and they're opposing forced vaccination. And 70% of all the truckers in Canada opposed the trucker cavalcade. On the other hand, they said that they weren't only there against masks and vaccination. They said they were there because trucker pay is too low and it's true. Now the people who work for some of the unionized companies, their pay 
may be decent pay. But many of these truckers own their own rig. They barely can make it through. They almost never see their family. They sleep in their rig. They're really the working poor. They probably don't have pensions, don't have health benefits, don't have a union. And so people who are upset because their life is just not going anywhere. And then the government saying you need a mask. We need those people on the basis of our shared interests, which is a reason that we need to support unions that represent people and will improve lives. It's a reason that we need to raise wages and ensure that people do have, whether it's Medicare for all or even steps along the way so they can afford health care. So that's an example. So I'd say that, um, yes, there is now a rise of a far right neo-fascist and racist anti, uh, you know, white supremacist uh, and anti-Semitic. And anti-Semitism and racism are at the core of the right wing. I had a friend who went into uh, the right wing chat rooms in order to understand what was the nature of the population. And they're both tied together. And so we're not recruiting on the basis of that, but we are recruiting, are engaging people on the basis of values and shared interests. Yeah. Should we so, open uh, up, Tim? Yeah, let's, let's open this up to folks uh, who want to ask questions. Anybody want to ask a question here? Or share a perspective, share your own story. <laughs> Why did you get involved? I have a question. Um, I'm Merle Sabado, and um, I have been uh, doing this work on and off uh, for a long time. And I thank you so much. You're very inspiring, to say the least. Um, and I was wondering how you stay hopeful with all of the frustrations now with the Republicans uh, and especially the two Democratic senators who are stalling Biden's agenda. First of all, it's how I stay hopeful and then the specific thing about the lineup of the Senate. Two answers kind of on how I stay hopeful. And then I'd like to know how you do, Merle, because you said you've been doing this a long time too. In part, I stay hopeful because I believe that is our job. That if you don't believe that change is possible, you shouldn't do this work because what are you doing? We're not playing around. I actually have a quote up here from Antonio Gramsci who was hired, who was um, uh, arrested by the uh, fascists in Italy in World War II. It's pessimism of the intellect. I know in my mind, this bad thing could happen. I know it may happen. I'll plan for it. And optimism of the will. My God, we are fighting forward. We are going to make this happen. So that's a mindset. In fact, I'll go further. I had uh, in the Biden campaign, I had thousands of volunteers in my unit. You, we really were very successful in, in recruiting thousands. And I had about 250 who worked as volunteers, basically full time. They were really a staff. And I mean 24-7. And so I made buttons for them at the end of the campaign. And it was all virtual. It was a <laughs> wild campaign. But there were two buttons that were my watchwords. Merle, I, I'm going to answer your question. I'm not avoiding it, but just a roundabout. <laughs> uh, but at the end of almost every briefing, I'd say there are two things we need to remember. One is we need, if, if we organize, we can change the world. You see, it's a button. I made it originally. It says Biden Harris on the bottom and organize. And the other one says, Let's see, love at the center. And those were my two watchwords. And I believe that you have to convey that sense with pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. But there's also other reasons why I believe that we can be hopeful even now. First of all, on the two senators, they're quite different. Joe Manchin is in a state that went 80% for Trump. Uh, we do not have a base of power that is strong enough in West Virginia. 
currently. Now there are groups that are organizing long-term and Manchin himself may not run again for a variety of reasons, but he's actually in keeping with his state currently and their views, but he also could take our positions because the people in his state want lower prescription drug prices. They want childcare, they want senior care. They, they want these very things, but we're not powerful enough yet to fully change him. But I believe Manchin will be for, he's already said he's for a number of these voting rights changes, freedom to vote changes, he said he's for it. And he wasn't for the exact bill we had, but he is for another bill. And there was a bill that actually was designed for him. In fact, the, um, uh, the John Lewis uh, bill that was named after John Lewis was basically designed as the one that Manchin wanted. Um, I know Carol's looking, then, then why didn't it pass? Well, um, we, we may have another shot, but it may be the voting rights. We also didn't have both votes. We didn't have both senators. Um, and I do believe uh, the Ukraine situation may change this, but I do believe that we would, that we will pass some version of Build Back Better. As of today, I think by April, there's one senator, a Democratic senator who had a stroke, uh, uh, Lujan. And when he comes back at the end of March or early April, I do think, unless the Ukraine situation changes it, that we'll have a vote and there will be significant investment still amongst the greatest investment in our lifetime. I think it will pass. Arizona is different. I think we have a majority in Arizona and we've just got to get it organized. And uh, uh, cinema is not popular in the state. She will have a challenger, and, uh, but she's not up for several years. She's not up this round. So they're both different. And let me give one, just one last thing. I wanna give some sense of why, though I do believe we are on a knife's edge. I do believe that the forces of reaction, retrenchment, hatred, division, could throw back everything we're doing, everything we fought for for 50 years and more in many places. I also think at the same time, we should remember a year before the last election, the general consensus, the smart people thought Trump was gonna win. And Joe Biden, he was really a joke. He couldn't win. And then people organized and they organized in South Carolina. And we not only won the presidency, we won the Senate, we won the House not by great majorities, but we are a majority of this country. Now, not holding the full levers of power, but we have won the popular vote in every election since, uh, I believe, 1988, except for 2004. Democrats won a majority of every election except for one year since then. Now, we don't have the levers of power and we didn't win the electoral vote story about how it was stolen in 2000 is in the film, very painful. But we are the majority of this country and that's not a BS position. But we do have to get our people out to vote and we have to get out to vote in the right places. And one thing that's amazing for you right now, you are in the right place. What you do in Pennsylvania matters to every single person in West Virginia, in Washington DC where I am and I barely have a vote. It matters, I come from Illinois. It matters all around the country, what you do for the Senate, for the governor, for the, for the legislature. And you know that you are gonna be the largest focus of oppositional attention. So it's one of the reasons I come onto this call because what you do matters so much. Each person you recruit, each person you register, each vote you get. And then I, I wanted to go back to whoever answered the question and see, did I address your question? Oh, Merle. No. Or did, and did you have something else to say? I did, and you gave me an idea for when I go canvassing, I'm gonna tell people that their vote is so very important and that's why I came to speak with them. And then also make sure you ask them a question. What do they care about? They may care about the potholes on their street. It's a question of voting. They may care about that they're not getting enough money. It's a question of voting. 
Okay. They, but you've got to tie into their interests and the shared values. And I also think it's worth probably practicing and doing training sessions jointly to train each other. So you go out and prepared, you're not figured. And if you've got, you say, you know, I went to the door and when I said your vote is so important and the person said, oh, is it? And it worked, great. Then other people can use your insight. If you try it and someone says, ah, no, it's not. And then you had nothing else to say. We have to figure out the rest to say so we can support each other. And one of the reasons for having an organization that Tim's coordinating is so that we can learn from each other. Thanks, anybody else have a question? Let's see, Sandy and Carol. Oh, Sandy, you're still on mute. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say a few words as to why I still have hope. My master's degree was in medieval studies. I took medieval studies on in order to learn the history of my own religion, which is which was based in heresy. So I actually focused on heresies and dissent and, and everything like that. And uh, I learned an awful lot. I learned that the Middle Ages was the first time in human history, perhaps, where loads of people, where, where hordes of people exercised their their feet to move into a space to, to get something or their brains to organize. And it was a wonderful time for people like us. What happened in, in something here though that I'd like to mention, and that is that fanatics could turn on a dime and hate the people they had been supporting. And this happened all the time in the Middle Ages. Uh, they would go away to, uh, for instance, uh, the Crusades. They were conned into the Crusades. They honestly were. They gave up their livelihoods and, and they, they marched off thinking they would be respected and they weren't, they were poor and they were looked down on. And, you know, so they came back home very, very angry. And what happened next? Robin Hood all over the place, every part of Europe. In fact, it was spread beyond Europe. It was, it was also, my, my daughter-in-law is Korean. I've read Korean history in the Middle Ages. It's the same thing was going on there and in China and all over. It was a wonderful period for good ideas what the, that we would call progressive. Women's rights. There were towns in England where women got the same amount of money for their jobs as men did. There were and citizens. So Sandy, this is yeah. what a remarkable background you have and that you bring. And what do well, you I, think then is the lesson for us from this remarkable history you've got? I think the lesson is to keep ourselves in hope. And also, as you say, and believe me, I agree with this, to speak with people who, who do have these crazy ideas. Yes, there's, there are some you'll never reach, never, probably most of them. But there are also some who are there because they're poor, they're looking for a family. You know, that's often the reason why people join these things. And but so it is- We can build and, our beloved community, our family. Yeah. A beloved community, and my church is one of those who sponsor that. And which, it, is your, which is your church? Unitarian Universalist. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. But Wonderful. no, so other the, churches. On side, oh, wait a standing second. on the side of love, isn't that Wait the a second, yes, but other churches. Uh, I, I love Rabbi Waskow. He's, he's our local guru. Uh, it's a... Uh, there are a lot of religions who come together here in this Rabbi city. Rabbi was on the Democracy Spring March with us. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I, I've, known, I've known Arthur since he was, when he was Arthur. Oh, really? Okay. He was a rabbi. Well, well, yeah. well he's, yeah. a, I, I he's think, a Not Sandy, I think we're going to move on to Carol, but I so appreciate yeah. that story. And also, yeah, Sandy, it, it just, just keep your, your heads on, focused on what is good. 
what came along though, and I want to finish this up by saying that the uh, the, the period that followed the Middle Ages, uh, although it did bring in the heresies finally into what they call the Radical Reformation, the, the regular Reformation didn't, you know, sneered at them or killed them, but the uh, the important thing was that you lost, we lost everything at the end of the Middle Ages because of the divine right of princes and the oligarchies and the banking industry and the people who had the ships that went overseas and captured other people. Well, the struggle, and, so Sandy, yeah. I, I'm with yeah. you. The struggle continues. Yes, I'm the struggle, it, it goes the struggle up continues. and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down like a sine yeah. curve. We're going to move on. We've got probably 15 more minutes for this call. Yeah. I want to get into right. really as many other comments as we can. A comment. I understand. Questions. Go ahead. Thanks, Sandy. Mm -hmm. And Carol. Hi. Um, I've been involved on and off since I was a kid, and I lived in Staten Island, and my father was involved in civil rights and anti war stuff. And um, I, I, I backed off a lot, and I, it's not the center of my life, although it's, it is much more now <laughs> since Trump got elected. But um, so you were talking about this is this is my, my frustration. You're talking about how we're in Pennsylvania, like, you know, Pennsylvania could shift the Senate. <laughs> um, and I've been involved with people going out all over the state. And um, I was at um, one of these Zoom things where people presented data on voting and voting trends. And one of the things was that the Republicans have been registering people and the Democrats not so much. And it's been particularly so in Philadelphia. Now, I have sort of purposely I, I don't know the ins and outs of the Democratic Party in Philly, but I know there's a lot of crazy stuff. I went to, so, but but the, the thing I took away from that was we, you know, I mean, she said specifically, you know, low, um, you know, people who were not represented and, you know, people of color, those communities need to get registered. Those are the, you know, those are the voters that need to get registered. Yet when, you know, the things I get from the state, you know, they're they're talking about, you know, talking Rust Belt people, you know, and I remember hearing from somebody that 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 the Democratic Party in 2020 prioritized white voters and Trump voters in Pennsylvania. And I met an organizer this weekend. I went, I volunteered to register people. Now it happened to be bad weather, but he, I didn't, he didn't have any sense. He was not from Philly, did not. It was like, well, you know, but we just Carol, need to get the Carol, turnout. So I want to take the big insight you've got, which is Pennsylvania matters. We need to do something. It's not being done by others, but rather than then spending our time focusing on what the others aren't doing, we can do some of it. And in fact, if this crew, those who wanted to do road registration, now one problem is how can you, who feels comfortable in doing this in a COVID safe situation, uh, masked, I mean, I've got my masks, Every place I turn, I've got my masks. <laughs> um, but to go in, in a COVID safe way, is there a way to begin as the weather starts to improve and start registration and connect with those organizations that are doing registration? I guess I, I need to find them. No, well, there's a, there's a table in Pennsylvania called uh, State Voices and Tim told me he's part of it. And they will have people who have plans on doing registration. Uh, NAACP. What's it called? It's the the uh, it's a coalition of groups. It's uh -huh. state voices. It's an it's a progressive but nonpartisan effort. 
because you can register in a nonpartisan way. Yeah. And you go and they'll help you go to the area and they'll train you how to do it. So you're well, not having to go out. Of, what am I going to do? Stand on a corner with a clipboard and say, you register? What are you? I mean, also their rules, their laws. But you go through the training. You'll go in partnership. You'll come back and evaluate how did it work. And uh, Tim said you're part of this effort, State Voices. Yeah, give me, give, me, give me a call, Carol, and we'll talk tomorrow. OK. And also, I think you should. You can also say to your whole crew, um, those who are interested, come up with a little plan. And on you know Tuesday nights, you're going to have the training session. You'll bring someone in from who's part of an ongoing, because you don't just want to do, you don't have to recreate the wheel, the people who are right. doing it. And also, exactly. you go out to one corner, someone else may be at the same corner, because they didn't know you were going to be there. So why not work it together? And you can work off of lists. Maybe you go door to door. Maybe you are doing it at certain sites where there's a large number of people who congregate at stores um, and that kind of approach. But Carol, your insight is terrific and you can do it. Are there other questions or comments? I see Stan has a comment or question. Yeah, well, it, it is, it's, it's a question, <clears throat> question comment. So, um, the right wing is be, is incredibly adept at also helping people identify their self interests as long as they're evil self interests, and um, you know so in Virgi Virginia was um, really an educational um, event where what happened was um, many progressive white mothers in the suburbs. I mean, I saw all these interviews with white. Former, formerly Democratic mothers in the suburbs um, were, were talking about how Democrats have, for, have forgotten regular people. They want to control the educations of their kids and they don't want them to feel bad. And I mean, the, the Republicans have, have demonized, as you know, uh, any kind of equitable racial education. Um, and this appeals to the self-interest, the, the apparent self-interest of many of the people who are persuadable, how do we overcome? How do we overwrite um, that, that um, uh, recognition yeah. of self-interest? So we have to remember, and you're right, Stan. There's a portion. You know, we, remember I talked about the sort of three parts. There's the ones who are with us, and we've got to make sure they come out, and that's the mobilizable base. And then there are ones who are against us. And they're probably corporate funded in the opposition and they're part of, um, uh, you know, part of an organized opposition. We're not going to get them. But then there's a middle group. And it's these two that we need. We need to mobilize those who are for us, but don't think their vote really matters. And then there are others who aren't sure where to go. The Virginia election with, um, an experienced candidate on the Democratic side really blew it on this question. It's a critical issue. Mm -hmm. I'm a parent. I'm concerned about my kids. But what if the answer, rather than saying, I can't remember what his line was, but it was almost like, we don't care what parents think. I don't know what it was, but that's mm -hmm. the impression it made on me. It shouldn't have made that impression. Partly, he was trying to do things to support teachers. But you could say, you know what, we all love our kids. We want our kids to have the best possible education. And we want them to think for themselves. One of the most important things we can do for that is ensure that the teachers who are with them in the largest part of the day, that they are well paid and well supported and help our children think through the questions. So deal with hard questions and find ways to come up with answers. I'm making it up the, the, the words, but it, it starts by saying share, share values. I always look for what's the value that we'll have in common. Share the interests. We all care about kids. Is it, is it right wing to care about kids? And we care about all kids. And we've put our kids and our parents and our schools and our teachers in impossible situations in this last year. And we want to do something about it. 
And so to you know, do that- Heather, I hope, I hope you go have a conversation with whoever's doing the messaging over the Democratic Party because I just want to kick them sometimes. Well, on this, on this there's actually quite effective messaging um, and both AFT and NEA, the two unions involved, yeah. are quite effective on it right now. Yeah. It's not the messaging they wanted that was being used. So Stan's point is really important, but there are ways to talk about it that link into people with values and shared interests, but aren't just mouthing words, but start with a real emotional connection. I wanna spread the message that Republican racism is killing white people because it is, and they don't well, get it. Well, there is this remarkable book written by Heather McGee. If you haven't read it, you might want to. And she tells the story of the <coughs> swimming pool that when, um, that there were public pools and white people could use them. And when integration came, rather than allowing the pools to be used by black people, the white people often put cement into the pool and closed over the pools. And so the white people were also denied access to the pools. And she mm -hmm. talks about that as a metaphor for how race also, racism also harms white communities. But mm -hmm. I actually think we have to get beyond the rhetorical phrases and find ways that we connect with real people. So to say, you know, you're a trucker. Yeah, you deserve better wages and you deserve Medicare and health care and um, the things on which we can concretely agree. And we have more, we have more in common with each other, the black truckers and the white truckers, than we have in common with the owners of the trucking companies who are locking us out and not treating us right. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, so yeah, um, I, I think we've got about five minutes. Are there other things people want to uh, raise or? I would just like to say, this is Yvonne um, Tisdale and hi, Heather. <laughs> Yvonne Tisdale. You know, we, we kind of worked together in, oh, I don't know, Yvonne, about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, with yes. With the Center for Community and Change. The, and the entire time with Community Change as well, too, so. Um, one thing that is of concern, um, Pennsylvania is a key state, and um, my concern is around the redistricting that's that's taking place or that once that they want to take place. In addition to the fact that there's been a lot of, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia and uh, Pittsburgh, which primarily are our strong democratic strongholds, but there's been a lot of gentrification happening. And so the demographics of our wards and districts are changing. And I don't know what impact that's going to have on sort of, you know, the outcomes in our elections, but I think we do need to have a strategy on how we're going to somehow either combat that. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is I've been trying to work with block captains doing a block by block piece. Uh, where I'm encouraging because those are the people that uh, people in the neighborhood recognize. They live on the block. They can disseminate information quickly. Um, but I'm just really um, concerned that the re them having, especially with us having uh, Republican control of House and Senate, that the redistricting is going to be very harmful to states yeah. like ours. Uh, by the way, Yvonne Tisdale is just she has a national reputation for her skill, commitment and experience in organizing. Uh, so it's great to see you on this call, Yvonne. Um, several things on redistricting in general. I don't know the case in, in specific in uh, Pennsylvania. You, you know much more than I do. First of all, people thought this is another sign of why we should be hopeful and not pessimistic. 